10X is easier than 2X is the brand new book by Dan Sullivan and Ben Hardy. Discover a mindset shift most entrepreneurs are completely missing. Unlimited growth without working harder. Available now, wherever you buy your books. Hi, Shannon Waller here and welcome to Inside Strategic Coach with Dan Sullivan. Dan, there's been a lot of talk, questions, concern about a potential upcoming recession. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk to you about that and get your take. So what are your thoughts on what's happening in the world? I mean, I love how you peruse a kajillion sites. You're very up to date on the news. I'd love to get your insight into, is there going to be one? And if so, what, what can people do about it? Well, yes, there's going to be one because it's a natural phase of economic, commercial, technological growth. And there's a phase where something brand new is being created and it's more valuable than what presently exists. And not only that, but it creates all sorts of new value. And therefore, there's a jump in productivity. And when you have that, you have a growth market, which is the opposite of a recessionary market. And a recessionary market happens when it becomes measurable that too many people are being overpaid for what's mm. being created. Mm. Interesting. Okay. So what happens, first of all, is that things which were really worth a lot in the marketplace are worth less and people aren't willing to pay. So there's fewer people willing to pay for something. And so the sales are not made. So mm -hmm. there's not revenues and profitability goes down. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that when things look really hot and they look like they have real growth potential, then a lot of people are hired now, even though they don't have capabilities, because then they'll be trained uh, and be ready mm -hmm. for even higher levels of economic growth. And that happens. And then after a while, their pay outpaces the value of what's being contributed. And so mm -hmm. there's a correction. A recession is a correction. Okay. And what it forces immediately is that some things just aren't going to make it in the future. Some businesses, some products, some services, and especially some jobs just aren't going to make it in the market. They were good for a while. They were extremely valuable during a period of time, and they were – valuable and then they were okay and then they reach a point where they're not okay and so mm -hmm. they get shedded <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> they get pruned they get yes. pruned and shedded. even since i've started my business i think there's been five or six of them you know mm -hmm. some of them more extreme than others okay the most extreme one was the 08 09 prime real estate triggered mm -hmm. recession the 70s were really weird from inflation, yep. and it was strictly mostly energy geared, that the cost of energy went through the roof because it was being controlled by countries in the Middle East. Loans got up to 18% in Toronto, where I live. You know, you were paying 18% for loans and everything. Yeah, and recessions, usually loans become more expensive. Mm -hmm. And they tighten up who's credit worthy, you know, so it's harder to get loans and then you're paying more for loans. But I think that this one's a big one because I think the conditions of COVID where you had lockdowns, I think it permanently undermined the global supply chain networks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that like it's a, 50-year correction. I don't think it's just a us for a five-year. I think this is a 50-year correction. I think it's we're going to be in recessionary and inflationary conditions for a decade at least. Does this have something to do also, and I'm not sure if it's part and parcel or if it's just happening at the same time, but the sort of dismantling of globalization that Peter Zion talks about? Yeah, yeah very much so. That the problem with globalization where you had supply chains that were providing almost everything just in time on a global basis mm -hmm. yeah. is that there's no slack in the system. There's no surplus. There's no backup to it. 
And the reason is it keeps getting strained to produce more and more results with less and less backup. Uh What I noticed over about the last five or 10 years, that the venture capital market in the technology markets was starting to resemble Las Vegas, what was going in on Las Vegas casinos. And that is you were making your money off the bet you weren't making your money off the thing to be created. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I remember one of our clients has a massively unique and different way of creating conferencing on a worldwide basis Mm -hmm. where there's an AI program connected to it. And the AI actually will sense out what's on people's minds that they want to be talking about and then actually creates the agenda and creates the actual marketing that goes out to a worldwide community and establishes dates and everything else. And then as the conference takes place and people are talking, it's capturing what they're talking about and creating all the topics for the next conference. Okay. We had it up and working for about two years. And I said, do you have IP protection for this? And he hadn't. And I said, You better get IP protection for this, you know. Mm -hmm. And we have a great, great IP lawyer in Silicon Valley. They set up a meeting, and they had about 12 people at the meeting, the venture capital partners. And they said to him, they said, so how far are you away from prototype stage, you know, where you can kind of communicate with the market what you're doing? And he said, oh, no, it's up and working. It's been working for two years. And... The IP partner said, well, that's going to be hard to sell, something that actually works. Oh, no. (laughs) So more and more, the money's being made on the betting of something that might work in the future. And you're heading for trouble here because large amounts of money are being created Uh that have no possible payoff in terms of something that's actually increasingly productive. Yeah. So it's like there's no foundation for the expansion. The recent thing that we had with the crypto exchange, Mm -hmm. the FTX, I think it was, Mm -hmm. they were taking in real dollars and you were given a token to play with in the game. But Las Vegas does the same thing. Mm -hmm. They just call it chips. (laughs) And guess what? Outside of the casino, the chips are worthless. Yeah. And when you win a game and you get way more chips, Mm -hmm. you haven't won until those chips are translated into dollars on the way out. That's such a great point, Dan. So major headwinds are coming, and they're probably not going to go away anytime soon. So... What's the best strategy? How do people need to be thinking about this and how can they take action? Because it's a very different world than it was for the past, what, 40 years? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to take a step backwards before I answer that question. I want to step back. The number one cause of the recession are the institutes of higher education, the colleges and the universities. And the reason is that they're being paid to educate people in worthless skills. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they've started training people in very advanced abstract theories. But what the marketplace in the real world actually wants is people who can actually have a trade, have a skill. But the universities are so far away in terms of their faculty and their administrators from the actual marketplace. They just see it as a very foreign world. Yeah, 100%. The other thing is they see the marketplace as a world of the past, and their theories are creating the world of the future, and people are betting on these theories. But they're like chips in a casino. They're like the tokens in a crypto exchange. Uh You can't translate them into actual dollars. So the students can get these advanced degrees, and they started their educational journey when they were four years old, and they're now 28, and they've got a couple of graduate degrees. Uh They've accumulated all these credentials Uh to our casino chips, but when they tried to translate them and go out into the actual world, they're worthless. 
Totally. And the people who actually are good at the practical, tangible, concrete are despised. Are despised. And because I'm just finishing reading this phenomenal book by Temple Grandin, whom I've been reading for 20 plus years called Visual Thinking. And she articulates this problem. She goes, they get screened out because of algebra which is an abstraction of numbers, which are also an abstraction. So it just makes but it... the whole weird. world depends upon arithmetic and geometry. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's interesting because I just know a lot of people who actually operate much better in the visual world. And they struggle in school. They struggle in high school. They barely make it through. And yet they're geniuses with their hands and to see how things can be fixed. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't read Temple Grandin, highly recommend it because she just gives you a great insight into how people think differently. But that's actually what we need. And our school system, especially higher education, doesn't support it at all. So what I'm reading completely... So what I would say is that people with real skills are now getting more and more highly paid. And I give you, I just checked it out in Toronto and Chicago, that if you're uh, graduating from high school this year Uh and you take a six-week welding course, which is actually provided by the welding industry, okay, at the end of 12 months, I mean, if you do what they say and you learn what they're teaching, Uh at the end of 12 months, you'll be making $60,000 a year. Nice. $60,000 for the first 12 months. And then take a high school graduate who is going into four years of college. One is that person is going to make minimum income, if any income, uh-huh. during the four years. Yep. And likelihood will run up a debt so that they'll actually be in negative territory four years from now. And by that time, the welder is making $100,000 a year. Uh-huh. Okay. And what's true of welding is true of carpentry, is true of being an electrician, a plumber, a mechanic. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that the world doesn't need university theories. They don't need university abstractions. Mm -hmm. What they need is people who actually know how to do something that actually creates value. And my sense is why there's a big recession coming is that we've produced over the last 20 or 30 years a university graduates and graduate school graduates who in the job market might be able to say welcome to Walmart. (laughs) Oh, that's harsh. Unfortunately, I I have to agree with you. A hundred percent. You want cinnamon or chocolate on top of your latte. (laughs) And they're so frustrating. I have nothing against Walmart or. Braces. Yeah, the baristas. I have nothing against them at all. They at least can do something valuable. Mm -hmm. So many graduates coming out of university are worthless. And they actually feel like they've been sold a bill of goods because it used to be an education would guarantee you a job. Now it does not. And I know actually someone that we both know runs a very successful PR agency in, in Toronto. And at least before COVID, it was great to have a four years of education because it does teach you critical thinking. But then she also wanted one year in Canada, it's called college, so they would actually know how to do something, which is kind of wild because university graduates don't actually know how to do anything, which is kind of a shame. A lot of what I read and anecdotal evidence as well completely backs up what you're saying, Dan. And people who do graduate university are really frustrated because they thought it was going to be different. And they're so much in debt. I know people in their mid-30s who are still paying off their student loans, which is just a shame because they're under this huge burden. Is it getting them the extra income? No, it's not. I went to four-year college, mm-hmm. started in 1967, and I graduated in 1971, and I had been in the Army before, so the GI Bill, which I was eligible for, paid for all my living expenses during four years, and I borrowed the money for tuition, you know, I borrowed. Mm -hmm. And I got out, and I got a really great job in an advertising agency, and I paid off the loan And also started my first business, but I was able to pay off the loan in about three or four years. Uh Yeah. It was a sizable loan. I mean, when I graduated, it was $16,000, but this is 50 years ago. So it's equivalent to at least $150,000 now, somewhere around there. Uh You know, I graduated on a Sunday, moved to Toronto on a Monday, and I wrote my first ad as a member of a big global advertising agency. 
And I had done all the preparation to have a job waiting for me the moment I got out of college, you know, and it was great. But you could do it in those days. You can't do that in these days. No, no, exactly. Well, that's interesting. I hadn't put it together quite like that. And it actually ties back to what you were saying about growth earlier. There are so many jobs open and that expansion actually can't happen because there aren't the, the people to do the work. Yeah, and that's what will happen. And I would say this, that I think that the ones who are going to take the greatest advantage of the recession and do skills training are going to be immigrants more than mm -hmm. native born people. Right. The immigrants see everything as an opportunity. Okay. They don't expect to have opportunity created for them. I mean, the reason why they're immigrants is because they were willing to risk leaving behind everything they had to come to here because in their mind, their chances were much better. Yeah. Canada, the United States, Australia, you know, the big immigrant countries, is that they knew that they would find a way of being valuable, but it wouldn't come over and go through four years of college uh -huh. to do it. Yeah. They'd go out and start being useful right off the bat. And so my sense is that the end of the recession will be when a significant number of young people you know, and by young, I mean between 20 and 40, right. redesign themselves to be more useful. And then the opportunities for growth are already there. The skills for growth aren't there. Right. And the moment that the skills for growth collaborate with the opportunity, then you get a, another growth period. But I suspect that a lot of people with the most higher education are going to be left behind. The train's going to mm -hmm. leave the station and they won't get on the train. Right. So find something practical to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super great context, Dan. Thank you. And it totally is validated by the people experience that I know, and some of whom are just graduating high school, and they feel very lost at college. Oh, the other thing I was going to say about immigrants, they don't have the same bias that we do about you need to have four-year university education. What well, have you. first of all, they have no social status anyway, so yeah. they're not risking their social status because they don't have any to mm -hmm. begin with. Yeah. And the other aspect about it is any improvement is great. Yeah. They just have a sense that any kind of improvement, any kind of growth is great. And uh -huh. But there's going to be a couple of generations of people who are just going to be casualties of an overinvestment in abstractions and theories. Ooh, well said. I like that. Overinvestment in abstractions and theories. Yes. All right. So let's go back to my previous question. So if we are facing these headwinds, which we are both in terms of the recession and inflation, so how can a company or somebody who owns a company really be strategic and set themselves up for success? I mean, my first thought is let's train people <laughs> to do the things that we want them to do. But how can we set ourselves up to be just really successful in this upcoming challenge, Dan? Stay in really, really close contact with your existing customers. Mm -hmm. Ask them, you know, three questions. What are the biggest dangers you have right now mm -hmm. that a year from now you have to eliminate these dangers? Mm -hmm. What are the biggest opportunities you have right now that a year from now you have to have captured these opportunities? And what are the biggest strengths you have right now that a year from now, they have to get stronger. They have to be maximized. And we call this the DOS analysis. And just asking them the question and giving them undivided attention for an hour over breakfast, lunch, or dinner will create for you as the entrepreneur, will create for you enormous amount of business over the next year. Mm -hmm. Because it's not that your existing customers don't have the money. They've lost the future to actually put the money out for. So they've got lots of money. They've got yeah. lots of money, but they've lost their future. So by asking your customers about their dangers, their opportunities and strengths, you give them a new future and you're the only person who did. So you get first dibs on their money. <laughs> That's so powerful, Dan. And here's the thing. I went through September, October, November, and I'm now in December with about 350 
very, very successful entrepreneurs. And not once was there any mention of the outside economic circumstances. Uh It was not brought up as a topic. Even the news is just filled with it and everything. And the reason is because by being in touch with their own customers and providing their customers with a much bigger future simply by asking questions, they have created their own economy that's oblivious to the outside economy. And that's how you never go into a recession in the first place, and you don't have to come out of a recession because it doesn't apply to you. Ooh, how to be recession-proof. I love it. How to be (laughs) recession-oblivious. Oh, that's way better. How to be recession-oblivious. Oh, that's fantastic. And it's great, Dan, because all of that is completely within your own control. And the idea of having your own personal economic system, you called it, is so energizing for me. Yeah. Love that. Awesome. I really like, Dan, that you haven't talked about, you know, have lots of powder to burn, like make sure that you're doing this with your hiring or that. I mean, mean, you have to have that in all times. You know, keep more of the money that you make, but that should just be an all the time policy. Uh What would you say about hiring team members, not hiring team members? What's your take on that in reception? Well, the, the two things, Babs and I, who, you know, were 30, 33 years into this. So when we have a recession, there are two things that we focus on. Number one is every day, make sure everybody's confidence is really high. So a lot of positive feedback about improvements, a lot of positive feedback. Any gain gets praised and rewarded. The other thing is come out of the recession with as strong a team as you went into the recession with. Okay. And the reason is because half your competition is not going to get out of bed Mm -hmm. during the recession. And the half that do get out of bed, only half of them will be sober. Ouch. (laughs) No, no, I'm telling you, you just lose all your competition during recession. Mm -hmm. All really great companies make their biggest market gains Mm -hmm. during bad times. Yeah. Mm. The other thing is that you're willing during recession to try out all sorts of new things that have been on the back burner. Right. Oh, I love this, Dan. This is so fun. Okay, so keep morale high, you know, praise and reward all gains and improvements. Have the goal to be to come out of the recession with as strong or maybe even stronger team than you went in with. And then, you know, try new things that have been sitting on the back burner. During a growth phase, sometimes you're just keeping pace, but now there's hopefully time and capacity to actually experiment is what I'm hearing. Well, it's kind of interesting because, I mean, we're saying this in public, but the public we're saying it to are people who are entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. But during COVID and as we've gotten out of COVID, people said, well, how is the COVID period? I said, oh, God, you know, I didn't want it to end. It was so great. We made so much progress during COVID. I mean, the new capabilities, uh, I said, and the new team members we hired during COVID. uh, I don't think we've had a comparable period since we started the company Mm -hmm. in the 1980s, Mm -hmm. as good as COVID. I said, I was getting to the point, I said, I just hope this doesn't end too soon. And people said, well, that's kind of cruel. And I said... No, no, I'm not talking about how other people did it. I'm just, you asked me the question, how was COVID for us? I said, it was phenomenal. I just loved it. And then people say, well, what if we go into a really long recession? I said, it's almost sugar on top of the dessert we already have. I said, you know, I mean, can we be this lucky? (laughs) Can we be this lucky? I said, we're just, I mean, we're going to be sharks at a beach party here, Uh you know. It's just amazing how much progress we're going to make. I can't believe how much progress is coming up just because we're having a recession. And, you know, either people want to get to know me better or they never want to meet me again when I say things like this. But the truth is that all the people that are in our program have the same mindset. Mm -hmm. Can't wait for the bad times because the best possible things happen during bad times. Mm. Dan, this is so incredibly refreshing and fun. I'm laughing. I'm trying not to laugh out too loud. But it's so great. I think if you're a strong, resilient 
DOS focused entrepreneur, this is a huge opportunity. And often when there's a recession, other people are struggling. So this is an opportunity. Well, the other thing is a lot of really great people get let go. Mm -hmm. So the talent that becomes available during a recession is way bigger. It's hard to find talent during real boom times. Yeah, which has been true recently. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I love it. So take advantage and be recession oblivious. Yeah. Dan, awesome coaching. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shannon. 